Good morning. Good morning. Wow, did, what great energy in the room. What, what, what a great turnout. Um, this, this is just absolutely fantastic. Just, just, another, just another reason why I, I feel that I have the best job in the world. Um, what a great turnout this morning. Um, my name is Daniel Kaur. I am the proud president of Arizona Western College, and welcome to our Horizon Symposium. Um, we, did, we did something very similar back in April of 2017. Um, and at that point, we were, we were kicking off. We were starting uh, the planning for our strategic plan. And we knew at that time that we wanted our strategic plan to have a lot of input, a lot of input from the community. We were a community college, obviously, but more importantly, we're a college of the community. And we wanted to make sure that our plan reflected the needs, the aspirations of the communities that we serve. So, so we gathered in April of 2017 in a setting very much like this to start that planning. Boy, what a plan we came up with. Our district governing board, um, adopted a new mission and vision that spoke about transforming lives, eliminating poverty, creating vital and sustainable communities, doing all that through partnerships. And then a lot of work groups over a number of months, 10, 12, 14 months, created 19 objectives that would guide the work of this college moving forward. We created a student experience statement. To my knowledge, we're the only community college in Arizona, and we were just a team of us. We're at a national conference this summer where uh, no one in the room had a student experience statement. It said what we will guarantee our student, what a student experience will be like at Arizona Western College. And of course, we capped it all off with our BHAG, that big, hairy, audacious goal of doubling baccalaureate attainment by 2035. So today, it's time to circle back. It's time to circle back to our communities. Yesterday, I was up in Parker. We had a, we had a great group, about 50, 55 folks, talking about uh, the needs of, of La Paz County this evening be in Somerton with, with a group uh, talking about the particular needs of, of South County communities. And today, we're here in Yuma with, with this great group, reconnecting. Time to talk to our students again. That was a key feature in the strategic plan. If you want to improve the student experience, you better be talking to students. Not once, but continually. At this point, I'd stop and ask that any current Arizona Western College students with us today, could you stand? Come on, students, there you go. We're going to want to hear from you. We're going to want to hear what you love about Arizona Western College. Because when I walk around campus I, and I stop students, I ask them, uh, you know, what's your major? What, who's your favorite professor? Uh, but I also ask them, what do you love about Arizona Western College? And I'll tell you, I, 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 my heart just fills with pride when I hear about an interaction with a professor or someone who's gone out of their way to help them or how they're challenged like they've never been before academically in their classes or how they have found their passion in life. I also ask them what frustrates them about Arizona Western College. And you get some unique insights as to what, sometimes it's, I have no place to plug my cell phone in, right? We've all been there, right? Huddled in the airport around the one outlet. So we heard that, and we've, we've expanded the opportunities for folks to plug their phone in. And, but, but you also hear some other things, some frustrations with our enrollment process, or, or not knowing about scholarships, or financial aid, or a particular class, or a sequencing a class, or not. So we respond to all that. That's what it's about, improving the student experience. So today we reconnect with our community, we reconnect with our students. It's also time to celebrate. 
the fantastic, amazing progress that has been made in the 19 objectives over the past 16, 18 months. It's time to learn. We've got a, just a phenomenal keynote speaker here that I've had an opportunity to spend a little bit of time this morning with um, about the current state of education and perhaps more importantly, the future state of education. And it's time to plan. It's time to revisit that plan, reconnect with that plan, uh, get input about that plan, and chart our path forward. I'm so proud to be the president of Arizona Western College. I am so grateful that you've spent some time, uh, agreed to spend some time with us here this morning. So to get us kicked off, uh, our partner in crime with this whole process, uh, our guiding light, if you will, um, Liz, Liz Murphy from um, Campus Works will come up and kind of set the stage for us as to where we're heading uh, with this morning's program. So uh, join me in welcoming Liz. Good morning, everyone. Can you believe it's been uh, almost, well, two and a half years since the first time we gathered here? It's really amazing how quickly time goes. Um, I do want to sort of give you a sensitivity to the kinds of folks that are in the room today. And I also want to acknowledge the level of participation um, from throughout the internal and external constituents. So Dr. Kaur asked the students to stand. I'd like anybody who's a representative from outside of Arizona Western College to stand. Will you look at this? Look at this support. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for the investment that you're making today in the future of your community. Because as we talked about at the very first Horizon Symposium, this strategic plan is designed to be inextricably linked to the needs to have this community thrive, whether it's intellectually, economically, you know, I don't see very many mission and vision statements that are bold enough to use the phrase eliminate poverty. Do you? I mean, how amazing it is that this college, this governing board would be that brave and how grateful we are that the community is here to be part of that effort because it can't be done alone. Last time I checked, AWC did not award baccalaureate degrees directly. Yet their big, hairy, audacious goal is about doubling baccalaureate degree attainment. That is truly a big, hairy, audacious goal. And when it was created, it was created because AWC knew that they could be the linchpin to that becoming a, ra a reality in your region. And for those of you who are participating from the community, you're going to help to make that a reality. I know a number of you who stood are from the university partners that support AWC students once they complete their work here at AWC. And we are very, very grateful for that. That BHAG would not be able to even be envisioned without your support. I'd now like to ask everyone from AWC who has worked on this strategic plan, either on an implementation team or in the original development of the plan, to stand. And then I'd like the rest of you to give them a raucous round of applause. <laughs> uh, you can't imagine the tireless hours that they have devoted to this work the difficult conversations that they have had, the innovation and the creativity that they've brought to the table, uh, looking at new solutions that will help the first year experience to be even greater than, than it has been in the past, to ensure that students complete with success, to reach back into the high schools, to ensure that when students show up outside the door of a campus for a, of AWC, they are ready to begin matriculating with college level classes. Reach back into the workforce to say, what kind of talent, talent do you need and are we prepared with the programs to deliver for you and to help our students thrive? 
once they leave their educational pathway for at least the short term. The work that you're going to be doing today um, is really around taking the next step with the plan. So in the last year or so, internally, the teams, the implementation teams have been working diligently on advancing key objectives along a path to achieving that BHAG in 2020, 2035, right? Yeah, I almost said 25 and everybody passed out, right? 2035. Uh, so they've been working really hard on those pieces. And you're going to actually hear a series of ed talks today from members of the implementation teams talking about some of the progress that they have made. But then we want to turn it back to you. So the teaser for later in this program is that we're going to ask you to give voice to what you heard provide your best thinking on what we need to get ahead of. Environmental factors change each and every day, and we have to give voice to those, and we have to respect those in our planning. Also to tell us where you see the obstacles so that we can get ahead of them. If you can see what's coming down the road, you can plan for how to get around those challenges. And we want you to bring your best thinking. And for those of you who are coming from outside AWC, we're really hoping that you see ways to connect your planning process back to AWC. We want to see the integration happen among the community organizations the employers in the region, with AWC, so that you are moving in unison, if you will, like the boys in the boat, for those of you who read the book, like the boys in the boat, and rowing in the same direction towards the same goal, which is to help the individuals in this region and your communities thrive. So thank you for participating today. Look forward to an exciting day. And to kick us off in that way, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Kaur to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you very much. Well, we are, we are really, really fortunate to have um, uh, an honored guest and, and, and key uh, speaker this morning. And I'm going to get it right because we practice. Uh, Anya Kamensitz. I probably didn't get that right. I hope I did, Anya. Anya joins our Horizon Symposium sharing her passion for the future of education. As an educational correspondent for NPR, she covers topics such as education, education technology, innovation, sustainability, and social entrepreneurship. Her articles have been printed in Fast Company magazine, The Village Voice, The New York Times, The Washington Post, New York Magazine, Slate, and O, oh, the Oprah Magazine. She was named the 2010 Game Changer in Education by the Huffington Post and won the 2009, 2010, and 2015 National Awards for Education Writers Association. Anya is part of the NPR Ed team that won the 2017 Edward R. Murrow Award for Innovation in Radio Television Digital News Association. Most importantly, she is here to share her words of inspiration on how we can foster a generation of leaders leading to an era of innovation and education. Please join me in welcoming Anya to the stage. Good morning, Good morning everybody. Hi. Um, so I just have to say, I was uh, at my table counting, and I've been to 37 states to learn and to speak on campuses. And what you guys is, are doing here is really special. Just the idea of bringing together community members, students, and all these different stakeholders, not just to say cool things, but to actually make a plan and do them, is really impressive. And so I, I just want to cheer you on for a second. Congratulations. <laughs> Um, and since I have the luxury of stepping back and looking at the big picture, I think that's what I've been asked to do today, is kind of make a, take a thread of inquiry from the very concrete um, and actionable and workable goals that you guys are setting to the really big view, the really big why. You know, and they say if you ask the question why five times, you'll get to, of anything, you'll get to 
kind of the meaning of life. And that's, that's where I'd like to uh, push it a little bit today. And I hope you guys will have, you know, pushback for me as well as questions. Um, so the new reality, when I say a new reality, the, the topic of this talk is taken from a book that had a big impression on me. Um, and it is a, a data-driven book about the future and also about philosophy and morality. And it was re-released in 2018. Uh, it's by Jonas Salk, who's since passed away, the, the uh, discoverer of the polio vaccine, a great humanitarian, and by his son. And what they did with this book was they basically observed that from the beginning of human civilization, uh, we had huge increases in population from generation to generation and huge increases in resource consumption. And from the time that the book was first issued around the 1980s, the, the rate of increase of human population had started to slow down and level off. And then when they reissued the book in 2018, uh, this is around the time that we're starting to anticipate a peak in human population. So human population is no longer going to be growing. And that is a, it is a very big difference in terms of the rate of acceleration and how we operate as a species on this planet. Obviously, at the same time, the resource consumption that we're doing as a species also needs to change. It needs to peak uh, much more quickly um, in terms of what we're wasting and not returning to the earth in a way that's usable. Um, and so what does it mean then to live in a world that's where expansion and growth is not what's happening, whether or not that's the goal? Um, you know, are we going into a time of nasty, brutish, and short competition of one of all against all? Or their alternative vision is this idea of cooperation, that we're going to continuously have expand in our care for other people um, and go from a competitive to a cooperative society. So they're positing in this book that taking care of the health and well-being of human beings in every part of the planet is not just a humanitarian thing. It's not just a nice thing to do. It's a must do. Um, and the other, the other kind of big picture way that I think about the moment that we're in right now really comes from Carl Sagan. Um, and I asked the students yesterday if they believed in space aliens. How many people here believe in space aliens? Um, good. Okay. We're not too far from New Mexico, right? Uh, so... Uh, so, so scientists, obviously, there are very serious people who ask this question. We live in an infinite universe. Why then have we not heard from other intelligent life on other planets? Infinite number of planets, infinite number of solar systems. Where are, where are they, right? One of the kind of more unsettling theories about why we haven't heard from the space aliens is this concept of a technological adolescence, which is to say that if you take us as the only example that we know about as an intelligent species, Right around the time that we escaped the solar system, escaped the atmosphere, and went into space, we also invented the atom bomb. So it comes to uh, this question of whether as we attain complexity as a civilization, we also attain incredible power that is very dangerous. And perhaps the other civilizations that got to that same point, whether it was way back in time, or whether it was right now, or in a little bit of future from now, they have trouble negotiating this passage where, oh my gosh, we're so powerful right now, what are we gonna do with it? Um, and so Carl Sagan had this fear, and he raised it um, in 1990 when they brought the show Cosmos back on. Um, are we gonna learn to use the tools that we have and the incredible power we have with wisdom and foresight before it's too late? Will we see our species safely through this difficult passage so that our children and grandchildren will continue the great journey of discovery still deeper into the mysteries of the cosmos? That is what's happening right now. That is so big, right? We know science is telling us um, that this is the challenge in front of us. Are we going to be able to continue the activities that we're doing and the power that we have uh, a generation or more into the future? And when you talk about 2035, um, you know, this is a very real thing. It's coming very soon. Um, so, you know, from a, from a data-driven point of view, I'm a very data-driven person, we can look at the various trends that shape the lower world that we're living in today and to try to understand how they may or may not continue into the future. So this is a picture of our national debt. Um, sorry, this is a picture of consumer debt. This is a picture of student debt, um, the national debt. Student debt, by the way, is that blue line that's rising even as uh, mortgage debt and credit card debt kind of reached a peak and then fell off after the Great Recession. Student debt continued to rise. Um, the national debt as a nation, this is how our debt is working. Um, very similar picture to our CO2 emissions, right? Ecological debt continues to rise. All of these things have something in common. We're spending it today, 
We're going to have to pay it back tomorrow. So, um, you know, and college tuition obviously rising in the same uh, way as well. So the thing is that we know about lines that go up and to the right is that they don't go up and to the right forever. They don't. Um, and there's a very pop, there's a very, uh, in science, a very famous example of this, and this was a chart of the reindeer population on a small island where they were introduced onto the island. They started to multiply. They had no natural predators, plenty of food, eight and eight and eight, and then one day, one reindeer munched the last twig on the island, and um, that was the end. Right, so, uh, you know, we throw around terms like sustainable, unsustainable, but I think all, a lot of times we forget that this word has a very simple meaning, which is unsustainable means you can't keep doing it the same way. And so when we make an argument for a radical change in the way that we relate to each other, in the way that we define success, in the way that we define cooperation versus competition, um, you know, radical change, it's not something that we're making a choice to do. It's something that we're going to have no choice but to do. And it's something that we're responding to rather than something that we're generating ourselves. And that makes it a very exciting and energizing time to be thinking about planning for the future because the people who aren't planning for the future are the ones that are really going to be caught out. And the people who think that they can keep doing things the same way um, are the ones that really are going to be left behind. And it's going to be up to all of you all who are able to be proactive and are able to cooperate um, to shape the future that we can sustain. Um, and that's not even it, right? We still think about technological innovation, and there's another important track of technological innovation, um, which is automation and artificial intelligence, right? So understanding that the, the percentage of tasks in jobs um, that is automated by task, um, so this is from a World Economic Forum report in 2018. Um, in 2018, out of all the task hours, all the work that's done, about 29% is done by machines, and in just a couple of years, it's going to get even closer, 58% humans, 42% machines. So what does that mean, this kind of automation by task? Um, when we think about it that way, uh, you know, right now it's very limited, and we built these systems to do very specific things, right? You've got your Roomba that... that um, uh, sucks up the dirt from your carpet, and you've got a system that tracks students' enrollment. Um, but general AI, as it gets better and better, it approaches the flexibility of human intelligence. It's going to be able to actually learn and come up with creative solutions. It sounds like a student, right? This is what we want our students to be doing. Um, and so we see general AI as the ultimate leverage in solving humanity's direst problems and becoming better humans ourselves. So this is a really huge challenge, because the work that we're preparing our students for the tasks within that work uh, is going to change, and the nature of the tasks is going to change. And um, the, the fascinating thing about this is, what I've been doing for the last couple of years in my presentations, is understanding how the rise of technology actually uh, supports the idea that education needs to become more human and more humane, so that people be, can be better at what people do best. Um, and I will uh, talk about this uh, a little bit. Uh, so the, 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 the proposition that I'm defending in this debate, right, is that to beat or join the robots and build the sustainable future, the resilient future that we need, we need a more human education that does have a technological edge to it. And so what do I mean by that? Uh, so in uh, a couple of years ago, Oxford University put out a report that talked about what are the powers, the separation of powers between computers and human beings. And the idea there being that even as AI gets better and better, uh, there are still things that humans tend to be better at. And I, I boiled this down into an argu argument for Fast Company about what are the four things that humans can do better than computers can. Um, so a proposition for this is that computer strengths lie in speed and accuracy, while human strengths are all about flexibility. And this is my description of the four things, making a sandwich, giving a hug, telling a story, and solving a mystery. Um, and I'll, I'll describe what those are. Um, so making a sandwich. So uh, in terms of our basic needs versus computers, humans need a lot of rest, they need to move their bodies, and they need good food. In terms of skills, making a sandwich means humans are way better at complex, unpredictable tasks in 3D space. So no matter how far we've gotten with robotics, and they certainly do well in factory settings, um, you are still seeing hand-picked vegetables and fruits. You're still seeing 
human beings changing diapers, making sandwiches, cooking, uh, cleaning, because these things are not, ro robots are not optimized for these types of things. And they, on a 20 year time trajectory, they are not expected to be optimized. Uh, this is fascinating for an area that relies, relies on manual labor. It's fascinating for implications like home health care aids in uh, an, an aging population. Um, the problem is that manual labor, although it is very special to humans, it's not something that we support or uh, remunerate at the rates that we'd like to in terms of it being a, a, a healthy, sustainable job to have. Um, the second area, giving a hug. So we're still turning, by and large, to human beings and not to machines for the emotional support that we need. So humans need emotional support, they need in real life support. Um, and the skills around this that are unique and special to humans are empathy, collaboration, management skills, inspirational skills. And the example that I often give is, um, you know, you can, there are machine um, programs that do a really good job of scanning uh, radiology reports and seeing if someone has a tumor on their lung. But you want a human being there in the room with someone to deliver that diagnosis to help someone understand their options and to offer that empathy and that support in that moment. By the same token, with the, with the um, enrollment management and different kinds of software programs, you can make it much more efficient to approach and retain students. But it is going to be the trusted relationship with someone on your campus that is going to determine whether a student decides to persevere and continue to be connected with the institution. Um, that's always going to be the human element. Um, the other two areas, telling a story and solving a mystery, really have to do with the cognitive um, specialties that human intelligence can have at its best, right? Um, and uh, so the first one is this idea of acquiring and processing new information or deciding what is relevant in a flood of undefined, undes, un, undefined phenomenon. Um, it's examples, a scientist who's dealing with trying to find a new compound to uh, treat a disease or an underwater explorer or a journalist tracking a story, and uh, basically these are processes of finding the answers. And uh, I, you know, I want I want to point out that in this world of information overload, overload, right? Telling a story becomes all the more important because we need to manage information flows. So we need to help students understand how to deal with frame their question around what data is available for me to find the answer to this question, how do I parse that data, how do I decide what's relevant, um, and how do I keep my eye on the ball and, and stay through the task until I found the answer. And if the data isn't there, how do I find the, how do I find the data myself? Um, and the corollary to this, by the way, is that a lot of our education system up until now has been focused on helping students get better at tasks that computers already do really, really well. <laughs> Does your phone want to join the uh, keynote? Um, so, so, may, so this idea of speed and accuracy, right? Like how much of what we've had to accomplish as students um, from K through 12th grade and even into college has to do with calculating things, numbers, or remembering dates, or spelling correctly, or using correct grammar, or looking up you know, answers that we could easily look up. It doesn't mean that you don't need a knowledge base in order to succeed, or that people don't need to you know, be good at spelling, but it, may, it means that the more of our energy that we spend as an education system on doing things that computers do really well, the less time and the less energy and emphasis we have to help students do the things that only students, only humans can do really well. So telling a story is one of them, managing these information flows, communication, fluency. And then the final level, I would say kind of like the top of the Maslow hierarchy, as far as what humans need to specialize in and can specialize in, is not just finding answers, but finding the questions, right? So as human beings, once we've satisfied our basic needs for shelter, for food, for water, for emotional support, safety, physical safety, uh, we start uh, having these higher order needs that need to be fulfilled for autonomy, for purpose, for mastery, to make choices in our lives, to feel like we're having an impact, to get really good at something. And education really needs to give students the tools to survive and arrive uh, at the satisfaction of those needs as well, or it hasn't accomplished its goal. Um, and the skills then that come with this that are special to humans, you know, in our lifetimes, <clears throat> Western Arizona College is not going to be led by a computer program, no matter how good that program is. Because even if the program helps you make decisions, it's going to be a leader who stands up and inspires you to actually act. And inspiration, um, leadership, strategy, thinking on a high level, that is what we need to be empowering our students to do because it is never going to be replaced 
by a computer. Um, and the other thing is, you know, coming up with questions to ask. Because a computer can solve any question you want, but the computer is never going to come up with a question, not an authentic question. And so getting our students to ask really good questions is something that uh, inspires us to strengthen in an aspect that only they can do. Um, so examples of this, you know, a doctor diagnosing a new disease, a lawyer writing a persuasive argument, the facts of the case are the facts of the case, but when you have a trial, you have a lot of people talking about one interpretation versus another interpretation, or a designer creating a new web application. So unstructured problem solving is something we need way more of in our classrooms. Um, so here are some sample questions um, that students might be focusing on that could take, it, that take advantage of these different aspects of the four things. They require data, they require emotional intelligence, they require ethics um, to resolve, and they can't be resolved easily. How do we sustainably take care of an aging population? How do we design algorithms without replicating bias in society? Um, what's an inclusive and fair immigration policy? Fair to people that are here and fair to people that have, come, have not come here yet. <clears throat> What's the fastest way that as a nation we can transition to alternative forms of energy while also balancing people's economic displacement? Or how can communities plan for more frequent natural disasters? What all of these questions have in common is they take more than one domain of knowledge to solve them. They take people with the humanities background, they take people with an ethics background, they take people with the ability to listen to many different stakeholders and to collaborate. And um, obviously they take data and analysis. So, the more types of questions like these, authentic, relevant questions that you're posing to students, um, the more likely that you're equipping them with the skills that they're going to need for the future. Um, and so for another perspective, what do employers think about the four things? So recently, Adobe, um, the design applications pro, uh, company, analyzed, using big data, two million job postings in growing fields. And the top three most wanted characteristics were communication, creativity, and collaboration, right? So communication, to me, that's a storytelling um, skill, right? Creativity is an interesting combination. It's, it's a little bit amorphous, right? But it's something we're starting to hear more and more about in the uh, educational innovation space, which is that we want students who have not just artistic creativity, but the ability to really come up with new answers, which, by the way, takes collaboration skills. Um, it takes emotional intelligence. Um, it takes this meaning finding, meaning making. It also has the question finding aspect to it. So it's a very complex kind of um, activity and skill. And then collaboration, just a word on collaboration. So there's really fascinating uh, research coming out about collaboration, what makes people good collaborators. And um, one strain of research actually found that so the, the task that was given to groups was a business case study where they had to predict what's going to happen next. It's very similar to what you guys are doing, like what is coming at us and what do we need to do? What they found was that groups that were made up of the best collaborators, the people that are the best at sharing space, the best at making sure that everybody was heard, those groups outperformed the groups that were made of the smartest people. So you took all the top performers and you put them in a room for some reason, it's less than the sum of its parts. Um, so that's a really fascinating comment on what do we cultivate and actually what do we reward, right? How much does our education system reward the individual achiever, the first person with their hand up? You know, when you come into college, your transcript has your grades. It just has your name and your grades on it. It doesn't say anything about the people that you worked with, the people that helped you, the way you are or the role that you play within a group. Um, and that's something we just have, have to do a lot more work on in terms of acknowledging, lifting up, supporting students to develop it. Um, the other really fascinating footnote about collaboration research is that um, a researcher at Columbia University Business School found that diverse groups do better on these kind of uh, collaborative problem-solving tasks. Um, and you might think that a homogenous group would do better because everyone understands each other really well. But actually what happens is the more diverse the group is, the more time they have to spend articulating their positions and the thought behind them and making sure that everybody understands before they can move on. And so when you have a diverse group like you guys have assembled here in this strategic planning, um, it really works well because you have to be very clear about the processes that you're using in order to arrive at the answer. And that improves everybody's thinking. Um, so, uh, you know, reasons, indicators in our economy and our job market, why do we need these skills? Communication skills because we're in an information overload. overload. Nobody is communicating with a captive audience except for me right now, so thank you very much. But most of the, 95% of the time you are competing, and actually I am competing, with information that comes in from other places. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> 
It is, we have a constant information overload, and so how do we be effective communicators in that, um, in that place? And whether you, whatever kind of enterprise you have or a nonprofit or government entity, you are competing with other people, and so understanding how to make a message that reaches and penetrates is such a key skill right now. Creativity, because the challenges that we're facing are wicked challenges, wicked problems. It is not a matter of deriving the answer from existing information. It is a matter of forging entirely new solutions. That's what creativity is. Uh, and divergent thinking, right? So coming up with more than one way to come at a problem. So if your first solution doesn't work, do you have a plan B, C, D, right? And then collaboration, because as I mentioned in the list of challenges, sample challenges that I talked about, none of them, what they have in common is none of them can be addressed without bringing in people with different knowledge and background. So there is a limited number of challenges in the world today that one PhD can be called upon to solve or have the solution to. You really need people with the humanities, a STEM background, an ethics background, people with uh, representation in your community, as well as people that might come from outside. And so that is why we need collaboration. The ultimate skill right now, the meta skill, I think I'm, I'm returning this over and over again, is bringing together different domains of knowledge and getting them to fluently interchange with each other. Um, and a slight digression into, uh, and I talked to the students about this, but you know, we, and you, I noticed that you were bringing in this Bring Your Own Device program. So uh, an unacknowledged kind of revolution that has happened in the world of higher education today is that students now have supercomputers in their pockets with access to all the world's knowledge. And so when you design your learning experiences or when you, you help students design their experience in their lives, um, we have to understand that this is the reality now, and we have to help students become more skillful in how they manage the information flows, how they manage the distractions, how they manage their emotional experience, because the way that the phone works is uh, it is really enticing to people, particularly people that are having emotional struggles, because it seems to offer some kind of relief from their situation, if only for a moment or two, and that can often lead to um, vicious circles of involvement and engagement. So it's not going to be simple. Not simple enough to just say, as a professor, leave your phone at the door or put your phone down, because you have to understand the reasons why they're so emotionally attached to their phones. Um, and we also need to be setting examples uh, as, as adults and as professors. And so we're all really struggling with this, and it's a cognitive burden on all of us. We are all constantly using 10, 5, 10, 15, 20% of our brains waiting for some notification of something that might be important for us. And that means we're all operating at a huge deficit. And uh, you know, my, I wrote a book called The Art of Screen Time for parents and for children to deal with this, but I really think that uh, in terms of education and in terms of the future of education, I foresee a, uh, a cognitive elite forming. Basically, the mass of people are going to allow their cognitive potential to be sapped by their engagement in technology in an unthoughtful way, and there are going to be some people that develop the meta metacognitive ability and the emotional insight to manage their relationship to technology, just thus that it offers more benefits than drawbacks. And that is something that we're going to have to collectively evolve past as a human species in order to kind of get over the bumps that we're in right now. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a little bit of a digression, but I hope not too much of one, because when we talk about technology, you talk about innovation, you talk about technology, you talk about technology, you talk about the promise of technology, but we also really need to uh, discuss the undertow of technology that's it's also impinging upon us right now. Um, another area that I would be remiss to not acknowledge, right, is this question of, okay, you have these plans and you have this future vision and you have this idea of the threats challenges that are facing us at a species-wide level, a civilization-wide level, a state-wide level. What about at a human level, right? What challenges are your students bringing in from their lives that make all of this way off the map of what they're able to care about or think about on a given day, you know? So um, the, uh, I was, I've recently been doing more research into this and more research into how we cope with trauma and how we become resilient to trauma. And I've mapped some of the coping strategies that I've learned about onto the characteristics because my, my hope and my uh, idea is that we become more emotionally intelligent as an educational community and we also uh, help students develop the skills that we need them to develop through the process of overcoming the difficulties in their lives. So, you know, emotion-focused coping is really the first level. That's what we do to manage the overwhelming emotions that come up with our lives. And it, it's something like talking to a friend, you know, doing something that comforts you, playing a game, taking a moment, having some a laugh. Um, and these are things that, you know, 
every student needs to have this tools, these tools in their emotional toolbox, and professors do an awful lot to um, promote that through their warm and trusting relationships that you develop with your students. Um, Problem-focused coping is the next step, and that is what you do to actually overcome the challenge. So if you are worried about paying for college or you're worried about someone who's sick in the hospital, um, what do you do? How do you reach out for support? How do you form a plan? How do you follow through in that plan? And then meaning-focused coping, hopefully if, you've, if you put the acute situation behind you or you're able to put it in perspective, um, using your mind and using your thought to think about um, you know, what is the meaning of this situation? How can I learn from this in the future? Uh, you know, are there other people who have gone through similar things? Can I be inspired by them? Um, how do I understand that everybody has hard days sometimes? And all of the mental work that we all do to kind of manage our overwhelming emotions. And all three of them are important. All three of them are necessary. Usually we need to go through them in that order and you can't rush people. People need to be in the space that they're in. <clears throat> Um, so, you know, for educators in particular, I think that, you know, the key words that have to do with this and uh, the helping students overcome the challenges in their lives, whether it be poverty, whether it be addiction, whether it be incarceration, um, are, uh, you know, obviously understanding trauma awareness. How do you teach with trauma awareness? Um, also understanding this notion of secondary trauma, which is that when your students are facing difficulties, you are facing difficulties. They, we are not isolated individuals. We are all connected. And the more pain and the more uh, you know, hardship that students bring into the classroom or into the educational environment, the more all of the people in the community are dealing with that. And acknowledging that and having the care for yourself and the support for yourself to understand that just because it didn't happen to me, it doesn't mean that it's not hurting me. Um, and then the corollary to that is this concept of moral injury. Has anyone heard of this concept of moral injury? So it's starting to be used uh, in the situation. We, we hear about it with sh soldiers in the battlefield. Sometimes you hear about it with, um, you know, healthcare providers. But basically the idea being that something is happening in the world and I am enacting something as part of a system that I don't feel to be completely right. And so it's hurting my sense of self, it's hurting my sense of meaning and purpose in the world. And so the more that an institution like this one is getting aligned with um, awareness of people's emotional issues and support, um, the less we feel like we're suffering that moral injury and the less it is impairing what, what people do every day. Um, and then obviously the, the overlying message being that, uh, you know, ultimately this, the difficulties in our lives can make us stronger. We can't rush to that message, we can't be Pollyannas about it, but in the end, um, hopefully we're able to give people the meaningful support they need to do the kind of coping that they need to do to then look back and feel like, yes, I overcame this and this is now part of my strength, part of my compassion towards others because I understand what I went through and I can help you as well. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how a college like Arizona Western can support the four things, right? Um, when we talk about the sandwich, right, um, we have to support our students as living, moving bodies, people that need to plug in their computers and people that need to get good sleep and people that need to move, you know, move around and eat good food. Um, so find, having a physical place space for people to meet, hands-on learning opportunities because we learn so well as with our hands physically, um, and uh, yeah, and, and promoting student wellness as well. Um, the emotional stuff, I mean, way for way too long overlooked and discounted but a, a college is a place of human relationships people learn because they're in relationships we have a, the developmental psychologist Kathy Hirsch pays it calls like socially gated brain babies learn to talk because they are looking at what other human beings are looking at and learning because of their emotional relationship to their mother or a caregiver and that is how we all learn so supporting that um, having openly inclusive policies, uh, helping students improve their communication skills, their negotiation, collaboration skills. Um, uh, all of these are things that can improve our emotional um, skills and our emotional well-being as well. Um, the story, telling a story aspect, obviously writing and reading, right? Very basic. Presentation skills as well. How often do your students work with large amounts of unstructured information? Um, how much often are they doing independent research? How data literate are they? How media literate are they? The new forms of, of literacy are not just about parsing a text, but they're about understanding who wrote the text, where it's coming from, what is their point of view? Um, can I distinguish between you know, a fact-based research-based presentation and, and a conspiracy theory because there are way too many of both of those um, available on the internet. Um, and then the mystery issue, right? This is an overlooked, but it, you know, has been core to the project of, human, of higher education since the beginning, which is that higher education is, um, you know, is 
Sophocles saw it, and as Aristotle saw it, the pursuit of the good life, right? The idea of why are we here? What is this for? Um, you know, life is not just about getting a good job. It's not just about having enough to eat, but there's a higher purpose to life. The more students are prompted to ask those questions, the better they'll develop their own ethical spirit and their own, um, honestly, leadership, as well as autonomy and mastery and sense of purpose in life. Um, so to put a little bit of data behind this as well, because I never make assertions without data, um, Gallup and Purdue University uh, embarked a few years ago on the largest survey of graduates in history. Um, and just to give you a little bit of ba a background on this, um, Gallup measures engagement in people's uh, careers, engagement in work, and they measure thriving in various aspects of life, which include health, family, um, and uh, socially and community base and so forth. And these measurements are not squishy. They have measured over 25 million people in the last few decades, and they correlated these measurements of engagement and thriving with things like a company's valuation in the stock market. So when employees are engaged in their work, when people are thriving in their lives, um, the economy does better, other health is better, marriages last longer, all of these other things. So they turned this lens onto graduates of colleges, and they, uh, they, they, grad they surveyed over 30,000 graduates of colleges from one year out to 20 years out. <clears throat> and one thing that they did not find was that there was any benefit measurable benefit at all to attending a private university, sorry to my mom and dad, or a Ivy League college or a top 100 college. There was no benefit to any of those as a group on, as to whether the graduates were engaged or thriving. But what did make a difference, they zeroed in on, graduates who were emotionally supported during college had more than twice the odds of being engaged in their work and were more than three times as likely to be thriving in their lives. What does it mean to be emotionally supported in college? Um, at least one professor made me excited about learning. Professors cared about me as a person. Or I had a mentor who encouraged my hopes and my dreams. <clears throat> Moreover, when you looked specifically at engagement in careers from zero years out to 20 years out from getting a, a degree, um, it didn't matter what you majored in. It didn't matter if you had a STEM degree. It didn't matter if you were summa cum laude. Experiential and deep learning led to twice the odds of being engaged in your career. What does this mean? It actually has a definition. Long-term projects of at least one semester, an internship, apprenticeship, or co-op opportunity, or even an intense engagement in extracurriculars, such as student government, or a newspaper, or any number of other things. So the correlation here is between students who dug into their college experience, who had these strong relationships, who were invited in and decided to go for it, that had a lasting effect throughout their lives. Um, so, you know, this is not uh, something that we can just thrust on all of our students. We need their buy-in. It has to be a collaborative opportunity. And uh, I think, you know, one of the most exciting things about what you guys are engaged in right now is that you are modeling exactly what the students need to be doing which is uh, finding your purpose, openly uh, deciding and understanding that you don't have all the answers, collaborating, reaching out for partners, and um, moving towards goals and understanding that uh, you know, it's not going to be a linear process, but you're going to learn and change as you go along. So I think the more that you can make this process visible to the students, the better it's going to be and the more successful it's going to be. Um, because the bottom line as I see it, as I look at the challenges that our world is facing, I think higher education plays a really important role, but I also think it's insane to think that colleges are gonna solve the problem. It takes way, way more than that. So this idea of wicked problems where you need different domains of knowledge, um, this is a really great example of this, right? So where we had, in a simpler world, in a world of linear growth or exponential growth and consumption of resources, where there are more people enrolled every year than the year before, and salaries went up, and America was becoming more and more powerful, um, higher education had a very simple role to play. You know, it was for a very limited number of people in the population. It was for generally white men, right? And, uh, you know, everybody knew that it worked a certain way, and there were certain steps, and seats were, seats were reserved for people along the pathway. Um, but today, it's just a lot messier, right? It's going to take some measurement of online learning. It's going to take mentorships, people coming from outside the community. It's going to take experiential learning. It's going to take students moving within and beyond the institution and across different institutions, 
from K-12 to higher ed to community colleges and beyond. Um, and then the paths that they're going to go for are going to be forking paths and moving paths. And we haven't even talked about the idea that demographic change means the growth in students in the future is going to come from older and returning students, people who are going into a second, third, fourth career, um, you know, the average career length, the average job length um, for many years now has been about four and a half years. So we see people changing jobs many more times throughout their lifetimes. And the institution can never be a place with just one linear path through. It has to be a place with doors open in all directions. Um, so yeah, that's my spiel. And I would really love to get your questions and your responses. Fantastic question. Um, so trauma awareness, I think, in the basic level, it means shifting from a behaviorist, limited view of psychology to a real story view of psychology. It means going from what's wrong with you to what happened to you. It means understanding the signs of trauma, that they can be paradoxical. Some people are very emotive and, and put out a lot of feelings, and a lot of people shut down and are uncommunicative. It means knowing that it's going to take time to earn someone's trust because their trust may have been violated on so many different levels in different ways. Um, it means allowing people to come back to you again and again and build a relationship over time because it may take them more than one try to feel like they're worthy enough to be in an institution like this. I actually really don't accord with that research. I've seen it. It's based on a single survey that's a large survey that's given over time, but it is only one measurement. And I think that if you look um, at the kids around us and the level of civic engagement that we're seeing, the level of tolerance and diversity and respect that we're seeing among young people, there's a lot of contraindications to that. I think that the way that we um, the emphasis that we're seeing on empathy didn't exist 20 years ago, and so how we actually see that as a standalone skill set um, may be changing, and we don't really have the tools to measure it, I think, directly. Um, but it does, you know, there's, um, I know that it doesn't help to come at students and think that their their psychological makeup has changed just because there's a generational change. I think that there's a lot of big, a lot of differences in how people express themselves, but I also think that people can grow in this ability to have empathy. And I think perspective taking is something that can actually be taught. Um, and I, I, I did research on this recently around ch parents and small children. And one of the things that they found that really um, actually helped with empathy was, well, first of all, fiction. So storytelling really helps with empathy. The more people get engaged and involved in narratives, especially narratives that don't include people like them, um, that really is like a master class in empathy, and they've actually found that people who are avid readers of fiction and students of literature are better at that perspective taking, because a lot of it is just like a brain skill that you learn where you're like, huh, oh, actually everybody in this room has their own story and their own awareness, and that informs how they're seeing something. Um, so that's one. Um, but the second thing that worked, and I think you have, a lot of, you have a lot of trust with this, is kind of direct moral instruction. So having clear rules about how people behave with each other and talking about it and having strong social norms and community norms of interaction really helps. It helps with safety, it helps with bullying, it helps with emotional engagement, but it also helps with people, I mean, 
with, with the physical sign of empathy, which is kindness and consideration. So it's something that we can all work harder to promote. about all the how millennials are today and they're this and they're that what do you see the future as they progress 20 years from now 10 years from now how that generational shift is going to go so the argument that i've been making since my first book came out in 2006 is that um the the generational impacts that we're seeing with millennials and now generation z has everything to do with how they're being treated and how the material conditions that they're under so, you know, uh, you know, my generation was known as Generation Debt because of the, they were the first generation that was not going to do as well economically as their parents before them, the first generation in American history. And so everything that was pointed at them as far as they are shiftless, they are lazy, they are, um, you know, they, they don't want to grow up, they're immature, they're staying in their mom's basement. It was all, a, a, it was actually a really, it was similar to kind of like welfare queen or like racist propaganda against people where you, you economically dispossess them and then you call them lazy, right? Because it's a lack of opportunity that we're really seeing among this generation that is why they haven't bought homes. It's why they haven't, you know, started to drive or buy cars. And so unless we have a huge generational retrenchment, I think we're starting to see this now because I think millennials and, and Gen Zers have um, increased their civic engagement. Right, and they're much more prominent in activist circles in certain, in certain ways, both on the right and the left, um, until they take political power and start voting and change, hopefully, the economic equation, um, they're not going to be seen and taken seriously, and these kinds of stereotypes are going to be allowed to be promulgated against them. And I think it could get very ugly because there's a resource hoarding that's going on um, among generations, and the pie is shrinking, right? So if it's going to be a fight between keeping Medicaid going and Social Security going versus, inv versus investing in education, if people get put at odds across a generational dividing line, that could get very, very ugly, and it would be bad for everyone, I think, if that happens. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. Yeah. There was an article in Wired magazine where he says, cause Hold on, Luis. There, hold, there on. Are, it, it, hold on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is better. Uh, so, uh, Carl Friston says that artificial intelligence is all based on free energy, which is the difference between what we see and what we want to see. And only humans have that ability. Like uh, the software on the airplane that crash didn't need to survive. It just needed to do what it had been told to do. Mm -hmm. It's the humans that need to solve the problem and to see the problem in the first place. Mm -hmm. So uh, read about Carl Friston and you'll, you'll see how, you, you cannot just really talk about this. Uh, uh, there's so many avenues to follow, but this is the guiding principle, the, the free energy. Great, are there other questions? Thanks. So what's your why? Um, so uh, we are now at the point where uh, your why can intersect with the AWC why. And um, before we do that, we want to expose you to uh, some of the work that's been done. Um, we really are having a mic issue, right? Okay. Uh, we Yeah. Hello. Hey, how about that? Okay. 
So before, um, before we have you intersect your why with the AWC why, which is really aligned to the student why, we're going to have you learn a little bit more about what's been going on with some of the objectives uh, associated with the strategic plan. So you're about to be exposed to some really terrific information from uh, five of the uh, objective implementation teams that have been working together. And in the spirit of our first symposium, you're going to have five five-minute ed talks, if you will, that will provide an update on the work that's been done. And I'd like you to sort of jot some notes while you're going through this process and listening, because after that, we're going to have you work in small groups and answer three questions about the future of these objectives how they intersect with your why, uh, and also what we can do to get ahead of any e environmental factors that we may not have anticipated when we first made the plan uh, some time ago. So first up, Dr. Allen. <laughs> I would yeah, like this mic, that. yes. Uh, I'm Ellen Reek, and I uh, am a professor of English at Arizona Western College, and I've been part of the guided, guided Pathways objective for strategic planning since the inception. And so I want to talk a little bit about what Guided Pathways is, and Anya kind of teed this up perfectly. Still? Really? How about now? OK. Um, Anya teed this up perfectly, because I want you to imagine for a minute that you are um, hiking Mount Everest for the very first time. And maybe you've done some practice and you've, um, you've gone to the top of our mountain, you've gone to Telegraph Pass, and maybe you went up to Flagstaff and you did some hiking and you're as prepared as you can possibly be, but it's still the first time you've ever done this. And so when you get to Mount Everest, what you probably want is to make sure that somebody has already created a path for you to follow. Someone's gonna help you find that path and get on it. Someone's going to make sure you stay on the path because you're going to want to wander off when you get to various elevations and you get a little woozy. And then someone, you're going to want someone to check in with you as you make your sort of incremental steps along the way. Make sure you get to the top, but also make sure you get to your next summit, right? And that exa that's the four pillars right there of Guided Pathways. And Guided Pathways is a national effort um, that is designed to address some really key problems that we've identified in community colleges for students, particularly over the past 10 to 15 years. Um, a lot of it has to do with financial aid. A lot of it has to do with the fact that we've designed colleges with this, are students ready for college uh, mindset instead of a, are, is the college ready for the students mindset. And so that's really a paradigm shift for us. So as you can see, there are a couple of things that happen. Students maybe identify a major that is not the major that they um, end up wanting to pursue. I think it took me a good six years to choose a major. Thank goodness I found English. Um, I, a lot of students, when they switch majors, they lose credits. Financial aid has changed their requirements so that they're very specific about what they'll pay for and what they won't. So students can easily lose time and money when they make changes. Um, frequently, uh, the programs that they choose to go into are not generic, so following a degree path into secondary ed English at one institution in our state is different than following it into another program, and we need to know that, and we need students to know that, and so we need to help them figure out which program they need to get into. So the goal of Guided Pathways is to get them on the path, make sure it's clear for them, give them the support along the way, and then get them to the next step. So we are also very data-driven at Arizona Western College, particularly since we have um, launched our strategic plan. So a big part of this is in response to the American Association of Community Colleges, along with the Community College Research Council and lots of other acronyms, um, and their efforts to identify how we do this better nationally. So Guided Pathways really is a national effort. And if you do a little Googling, um, you'll see that California has sort of really launched early with Guided Pathways, but we're following a national model. And the whole idea of the model is to say that we know that we all do some things really well at our community colleges, and we have some great programs on our campuses, but how do you do it to scale? How do you do it so that every student gets that same experience and not just a few in various programs? So that's one thing. No, I have to go back. <laughs> um, 
The other thing I want you to know, uh, two other things I want you to know, is that um, Arizona, we, our timing was really good on this because, and Andrew Clegg is here from the um, Arizona Center for Student Success. He promises we're gonna change the name of that, which is good, because I keep tripping over it. Um, this is all 10 community colleges came together just this past year uh, and formed the 16th in the nation um, Student Success Network. This is a consortium of the community colleges that are working, and guess what? Their focus initially is on guided pathways. So we've joined a conversation, not just nationally, but in our state, and um, some of us were able to attend a convening, the first convening of this group last June in Phoenix, and we brought a lot of information back with us. Andrew even said to me earlier that we're being used as a model now because we've adopted some of this, which I'm pretty proud of, I have to say. So these posters you see around the room, part of a Taste of the Future event that we did um, last month. Uh, we did a disaggregated data party uh, in September. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> so really digging deep into questions that maybe community colleges don't traditionally ask, the kinds of questions that don't get reported um, you know, to the federal government, for example, or to the state, but questions that we need to be asking about how we get and keep our students on their path and transferred. Okay, now. <laughs> um, so the impact for students is super exciting. You all know about the UMN La Praz Promise. I, um, if you don't, you're probably going to hear about it in a little bit. Uh, we're going to start in fall of 20 by launching a, um, our first cohort of students into this Guided Pathways. So we'll pilot it, make sure we can contain it a little bit, and then we're going to launch it um, campus-wide in fall of 21. A couple of key components. One is a um, student success course. Uh, we know for sure that, um, that students do not do optional, so this is going to be a multimodal, um, off offered in a variety of ways, a success course that is going to help them make some career decisions, uh, really see their future before they have to make that commitment to an actual program. Uh, meta majors are a big part of this, and if you want to talk about meta majors and, and see some pretty, pretty graphics, there's some over on that orange table in the back. Um, these are clusters of degree, pro um, degree options that students can come into and sort of explore before they have to commit. Um, Upgraded technology, uh, which you'll hear more about in a little bit, and then finally a capstone course that really gets them ready to go out into their professional lives by focusing on resume writing and scholarship applications and um, creating a professional profile. So it's really about creating that sort of hug for a student from start to finish. We call it being an educational Sherpa along that path when you're climbing Mount Everest. So there is much more that could be said about guided pathways, but um, I just got my five minutes signed, so I'm going to turn it over to the next person. But that is the exciting work that is going on with guided pathways at Arizona Western College. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Professor Jenny Bowie. I teach English as a second language and English for academic purposes on our San Luis campus. And today I'm going to be talking about the high school articulation committee's work. Um, so our two of our goals are to strengthen the K through 12 pipeline into guided pathways, as Ellen was talking about, uh, as well as cultivate relationships with local high schools and also to enable students to be more successful in college level coursework, even before they arrive to us. Um, <coughs> sorry, I've been battling with this cold for three weeks. <laughs> um, so our revised objective, it still focuses, our, our original uh, objective focused more on the developmental curriculum, and our revised objective focuses more on increasing student eligibility, enrollment, retention, and success in college level coursework. Um, we're still focused on partnerships, reaching students where they're at, and getting them ready for post-secondary success. So we did a ton of research, I won't bore you with it, um, but some common threads emerged which were mutual cooperation, collaboration, uh, and respect, as well as co-design, co-delivery, and co-validation. All the co's, together. <laughs> Um, so in this vein, uh, we would like to offer a teaching symposium, which would be a collaboration, <laughs> another co, <laughs> between high school and college instructors where they would hopefully be co-presenting. 
Uh, also, we found that targeting smaller at-risk groups um, who have the potential to be more successful with additional appropriate support was key. <coughs> um, so from Uh, ah, okay. I also wanted to mention that a large population of students have already been tested uh, in order to inform our interventions. So students have already been uh, positively impacted, actually, uh, through some uh, early college experience and other AWC faculty who are embedded in the high schools. We plan to expand these offerings if we have enough faculty. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are three central interventions that we would like to offer. Uh, we would like to continue offering courses with embedded success strategies, uh, maybe a potential summer bridge program and placement boot camps. All of these interventions would provide some of the support that Anya was emphasizing, the uh, metacognition, emotional intelligence, habits of mind, soft skills, as well as academic and career exploration to really get them on the, pa the, the, right, p well, the right path for them. As far as our success uh, in the short term, uh, we will know that our objectives have been successful with students completing the course and or programs mentioned. The placement boot camps have already showed success. Aman's here, I think, yes. Aman and Brett, um, they have already been able to give uh, students more preparation for the math placement test because I don't know if you know this, sometimes students don't study for the placement test. <laughs> um, so we've already seen success there. Um, in the long term, the more longitudinal, uh, we will examine their success and persistence in subsequent, subsequent coursework and through graduation. And uh, here are our list. I hope I captured everybody, uh, the people who have contributed. So thank you. Hi all, um, my name is Mandy Suliard and I work in Information Technology Support Services here at AWC. I'm also one of the tri-chairs of SACIT, the Strategic Advisory Committee for, uh, let's see, Instructional and Information Technology. Um, <laughs> I'm a bit more of a writer than a speaker, so I'll be using my notes more than the rest of y'all, but that's okay. <laughs> so, a well-supported technology-enriched learning environment is essential to pretty much any educational institute in today's world. AWC has limped along the last few years with an aging learning management system and aging hardware infrastructure. From the fiber that serves our internet, to the servers that host our processes, to the desktops that folks interact directly with. That's all changing drastically now. Sorry. <laughs> Surveys were conducted among students, faculty, and staff. That data was analyzed, and a plan was formed to make improvements that would benefit as many of the parties as quickly as possible. Indoor wireless internet was a huge concern to all parties involved, and was addressed in 2018 and 2019. There are still some areas being upgraded as money comes in. Over the last 18 months, AWC has implemented 400 new desktop computers and upgraded 200 more, to help faculty, staff, and students get their work done more efficiently. In combination with distance education and a representative selection committee, an RFP was recently completed to select a new learning management platform, Canvas. Alongside the technology changes, AWC will need to work to implement policies and procedures to support the success of the transition. Ideally, all AWC courses would use a standardized approach and utilize enriched online course materials in every class. This would provide additional accessibility and consistency to students, and we all know consistency is key for everyone. Increasing online coursework availability is another goal of the Enriched Technology team. Other community colleges in Arizona are able to offer coursework that we are not. We believe we should offer similar coursework to retain students and make it easier to complete their degrees. Imagine if AWC students could take online hard science courses. 
they could complete their degrees faster and not need to transfer to other institutions if they aren't able to schedule in-person courses. Assessment and student portfolios are another important topic to an enriched technology experience at AWC. IT will help focus on assessment in the second half of 2020. AWC has also entered the eSports arena. Coaches from AWC's ITSS team are currently working with athletes to compete in club competitions. In the near future, the National Junior, or I'm sorry, in the near future, they will join the National Junior College Association of Athletics and compete at a national level. Gaming is an integral part of life for so many people, but it's often overlooked as a waste of time or a, just a hobby. Um, gaming itself can be a job for the right person, and alongside the myriad games in, or the myriad jobs in game development, support, and production. Gaming also has such a huge community impact on the social lives of students who previously weren't involved in any clubs or considered competitive athletes. I'm really excited about this point, actually, because I think it shows AWC's commitment to making students feel accepted, welcome, involved, even if, they may, even if it may seem unconventional to some. Frequently in IT, we are so busy with what's happening behind the scenes, we don't get to go out and see the results of our work. It's wonderful to see my team, who in college may have identified with the then outcast gamers, step into the community and share their joy and knowledge with others. Enriched technology means so much more to the amazing student experience than just bringing con contemporary technology to campus. It helps provide flexible, accessible services and learning approaches, as well as a connected community where students belong. So, thank you all for your time. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Good morning. I am Professor Bertha Avila, Administration of Justice and Homeland Security, and I'm here with you today to discuss a little bit about our work on prior learning assessment. So let me tell you a little bit about me first, okay? So I'm a retired police officer, and my colleagues are around here also retired police officers, and we gain a lot of skills and knowledge through our academy work. We live in a southernmost part of Arizona where we are a wealth of, of uh, first responders of fire science, medical, law enforcement personnel. We are required to read credentials at the national level, if not state level, where we acquire skills and knowledge and learning outside the traditional classroom known as a community college. Many of us completed high school but because life happens, we had to go straight to work. In those classrooms that we called, in my case, was um, also in Tucson, the Arizona Law Enforcement Training Academy, and in Glencoe, Georgia, FLETC, Federal Law Enforcement Training Academy. I went last night to my files in, the, in my garage, looked at the dusty box, and I counted over, I stopped counting over 50 completed certificates of successful completion of the following. I'll just name a few. And it required that I must demonstrate successfully pass with 90% proficiency in taking apart a weapon, cleaning it, and putting it back together, read, learn, recite arts, parts of the United States, uh, United States Constitution, read, learn, execute and write the Fourth Amendment and demonstrate in the field to protect the individual's rights. It's an accumulation of thousands of hours that we acquire. So, in prior learning assessment, we do such as that. We value the learning. If we are truly an educational institution that values learning, we need to open up our books and pay attention to the industry that is thriving. So we were woken up and reminded of such value and not, forgot, not to forget the philosophy that we are here for. A few years ago, and I know my colleagues around here, Professor Smith, could also attest to the following. 
we were uh, confronted with an individual, or actually he came to our door, and he says, this is our situation. We have thousands of training in our respected academies, thousands of hours, and we need to hire agents from within the uh, organization. Our agents had to go to work immediately after high school, and we need to promote from within, but they lack the associates or the baccalaureate degree so that they could promote. Tell us, AWC, what can you do for us? And we're like, wow, <laughs> you're talking about our problems that we had, right? So it really forced us to pay attention to ourselves, to open our books and look at the world around us and remind us is why we are here. We need to acknowledge those skills, the learning that occurs, and tell ourselves that it's not only about higher education, it is not only about a thriving economic workforce. It is about making connections, talking to each other, opening our books, and recognizing the value of education that does and do occur outside the um, college setting. We have individuals, uh, most recently from the Fire Academy, recognizing the NIMS and FEMA training that occurs, critical incident management and such. We also have uh, Border Patrol agents with the multitude of training. So why is that important to us? It is important to us not just for enrollment, not just for retention, but to continue that thriving economic workforce that we are so proud of in our area. We also learn one something very provocative and sexy thing about adult learners. Why do people come back to school? Why do adult learners come back to school? Anybody, before you look at the slide? Why do people come back to school, adult learners? Why do they come back to school? Promotional opportunities, we say. I want to be an example for my daughters, my sons. Recertified in the field. A recent survey told us the following. People want to, adult learners want to come back to school because they want to finish what they started. They finished high school, they went one or two semesters in college, and they did not complete. They want to finish what they started. We're like, wow, like a push, All right? So that is very important for us so that we could help the individuals to fulfill their educational attainment at, at Arizona Western College. How do we measure success? Well, there's so many things that we could measure success. We have already had several individuals from different organizations representing our uh, first responders walking the line and seeing their wives and, and uh, kids, ch older children also graduating at the same time here at Arizona Western College or at NAU, and when to increase those numbers. It is a very satisfying opportunity to see that. I'll leave you with this one last note, and I do need to put my glasses on for this one. <laughs> we have to focus on improving people's careers, learning, power, and their lives. We have to experiment and go beyond existing mechanisms and, tradition in, and traditions for training and learning. We have to, and we must, and we have. We have and will continue to think outside the box. Our industry partners have asked us many times, and we are fulfilling that promise. Our books are open, and um, again, I am Professor Bertha Avila. I'm looking forward to any questions. Thank you. Lori asked me if I wanted to drive. Yes, I want to drive. <laughs> Good.
Good morning, everybody. My name is Joanne Chang, and I can proudly say, and I think Dr. Kaur will support me on this, is that we saved the best for last. <laughs> I'm here to talk about making education accessible through open educational resources, or what we commonly know it as, as OER for short. For those of you who are not familiar with OER, OER is essentially teaching, learning, research materials that have been released into the open, uh, open forum or open domain or given an open license such that there is no cost to access them and that users have the ability to adapt and to redistribute with little to no restrictions. So why is this important to us here at AWC? Well, interestingly, this graph is very reminiscent to one that Anya had given, but this is looking at the cost of textbooks. Textbook costs have skyrocketed. Oops. Oh, it's quick. <laughs> very touchy. That's stick shift. Whew. All right. Okay. So, yes, textbook costs have skyrocketed comparatively to medical costs, new home prices, and even in your general consumer price index. So then that begs the question, how are students purchasing those textbooks? I recently came across a website, a group called the Applied Educational, uh, Applied Educational Systems. They featured a survey of how students purchased one or more of their textbooks. So it makes sense that most students purchased a used textbook, okay? But I think the most disheartening statistic that they featured right here is the second one. The 66% did not even purchase a textbook. So as you can imagine what a disadvantage those students are having to face if they don't even purchase a textbook, okay? So that's a big disadvantage for, for our students and their learning objectives. What does that mean for us here in Yuma? So in Yuma, we also have to take into consideration our per capita income. In Yuma, according to a, uh, in 2017, the per capita income was $21,665. We are approximately $8,000 less than the average in the Arizona in general, but also $10,000 less in the US average. Of our 11,000 students that we have here, we have mostly part-time students, about 40% of them are using financial aid. So we know that our students are stretching that dollar to complete their educational goals and trying to complete their career path. So for us, okay, we know that if we did this OER objective, we are able to provide our students the ability to be prepared from day one without having that worry about that textbook and how much that cost is going to be. As we previously mentioned, we hosted the Taste of the Future event, and uh, Angela Creel, uh, the director of library, uh, library resources, was also there to help me feature OER to our faculty, staff, and students. We had a poster board. We asked students, if you did not have to purchase a textbook, where would you put that money? Where would you spend it? As you can see, top three, bills. They would pay for bills. They would pay the associated costs of owning a car. And third, rent. Okay. So for our OER objective, our goal is to aim for 50% of our classes to be OER, offer OER by July 2022. So as we move forward in this objective, we have been trying to let our students know, educate them, and say, hey, did you know that you can actually search through a filter on our course catalog in self-service for the no-cost OER or low-cost courses. Now, low-cost courses are essentially courses that have textbooks or learning materials that are less than $40. And you can actually search for these classes through our website. Okay? So students now have the ability to look for these classes on our self-service. I'm actually pretty proud of our faculty so far. They've slowly started to gain some steam. For this upcoming spring semester, we do have 72 courses that are being offered as no cost, low cost. 
We just recently appointed Scott Donnelly as our OER director, so he's pretty much our point person now, such that he can do more recruitment. He's going to be able to aid our faculty members in converting their classes into OER or finding that low-cost alternative for them. And just to give you an example of what happened just this past semester, and I actually saw Professor Jacob Gibson here. He is one of our environmental science professors. Him and Dr. Laura Alexander decided to move their EMV 101 class into OER. In general, publisher's textbooks for a paperback is about $114. We offer five sections of EMV 101, 24 students. Okay, 24 students times that five sections. Okay, it gives you 120 students times $114. So you are looking at, for just this semester, a savings of $13,360 just for that semester. And that's just for only one course type. So we are quite excited. Long term wise, as we said, we are looking for that 50% mark, right? So on average, AWC offers about 1,400 sections per semester. So it's a pretty big goal. We are aiming for 700 of our sections to be no cost, low cost. And of course, if we reach that goal, we'll be able to have this nice big price tag that we can hope to show everybody of how much we saved our students in terms of our textbook costs. So thank you, everybody. I want to thank my team. Thank you, Dr. Chain. You, you, you were not lying. OER is one of my favorites. I, I love all 19 objectives, but we have got to do something about the cost of textbooks, and we are. And we'll hit that 50%. Uh, mark my words, before July 2022. Uh, no pressure, Scott Donnelly. I, I, I think we're on the way, and we'll hit that. Um, as we move into some table work, I wanted to do a, a couple of things real quick. First, I want to recognize uh, the presence here this morning of our district governing board members. Uh, I'm, I'm really uh, just so grateful for the support of, of those five elected board members. Um, this morning we're joined by board chair, Mr. Dennis Booth. If you could stand and be recognized, Mr. Booth. <laughs> board member Ana Camacho, Ms. Camacho. <laughs> board member, Mr. Richard Lamb. Board member Maria Chavoya. We were going to be joined by our fifth board member uh, this morning, Ms. Olivia Zepeda, uh, and, and then we learned that uh, she is the proud grandma of a beautiful baby boy born at 3 a.m. this morning. Um, so, right? Yeah. <laughs> Our newest matador, exactly right. Uh, eligible for dual enrollment in maybe 13, 14 years. Absolutely. Um, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, and, and CEO of, of Campus Works, uh, Liz Murphy, to join me on stage again, as well as uh, Laura Campbell. I think we have a little presentation planned. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Campus Works has been just an amazing partner a partner in this strategic planning process right, right from day one. Uh, as well as uh, now we've increased that partnership and, and they've uh, been on campus doing some great work for us, integrating with our team to improve our, our technology services. Uh, but most importantly, a partner and a commitment to our students and our communities. Uh, really, um, Campus Works through Liz's leadership gets it. And um, we are the proud recipient of a uh, contribution from, from Campus Works to help support uh, specifically the La Paz Promise and the Yuma Promise. Um, and I think we have one of those great giant checks that we can, yeah. So, <laughs> Campus Works. Campus Works has, has donated $25,000 to the uh, Arizona Western College Foundation, again, in support of the La Paz Promise and the Yuma Promise. And again, just a word about that, the BHAG, right? It's all about the BHAG. When you walk into my office, and, and many of you have, I have a giant poster of the BHAG. That's what I look at each morning when I walk in. It's about doubling baccalaureate attainment in our communities. That was in our strategic plan. Then how do we get there? 
we didn't know about, we weren't thinking about the La Paz promise and the Yuma promise when we created that BHAG three years ago. But that's the venue in which we get there. That says to every high school graduate that what you need to do is complete that financial aid form, right? That's the key. That triggers everything. You enroll full-time at Arizona Western College and maintain continuous full-time enrollment and that when you graduate, and we'll support you along the way, and when you graduate, 100% of out-of-pocket and, tuition and fees will be refunded to you if you're here in Yuma, as soon as you enroll in one of our three phenomenal state universities located right here in Yuma, that restriction doesn't exist in La, in, in La Paz because we don't have uh, the university partners with the presence there just yet. That's a game changer, folks. And I just want to appreciate uh, Campus Works, their generosity. There's something going on here. There's some momentum. You're feeling it this morning in this room. The La Paz promise, the Yuma promise gets us uh, gets us to where we need that phenomenal BHAG. So, Liz, just a couple of words about the donation and what you were thinking. Uh, you know, our why, the Campus Works why, is making higher education accessible to everyone. That is our, that's our vision statement. Um, that's our big, hairy, audacious goal. And um, our employees couldn't think of an organization that was more worthy of a demonstration of that commitment uh, than Arizona Western College. So it's our privilege. Thank you.